Good morning, everyone. Give you all a warm welcome. It's great to see uh, each and every one of you here uh, today. Um, a special welcome to uh, any uh, visitors who are with us. Um, it's just so good to have you to do encourage you to stay, uh, not just through the service, but for uh, refreshments afterwards down in the, the coffee area and the opportunity to, to spend time, time together. Now, I have something special under the table here. This is the uh, Six Mile Water Indoor Bowling League Perpetual Trophy. Um, so our lot won it. Well done to them. <laughs> we're, we're flying high at the minute, and this was also this is also a charity event. So it's a great uh, commendation to them that. Uh, 1,400, over 1,400 pounds was raised for the Chest, Heart and Stroke Association as well. Okay. Now, do we have any birthdays in the last or coming week? Just a few shuffles there. Don't see anybody moving. Okay, we're going to have a big flood next week then. Don't want to highlight too many uh, things or take up too much time. PW outing on Saturday 27th of May was mentioned last week. Uh, please take one of those uh, things and respond to that. It would be great if you were able uh, to be part of that. Last week, uh, I, I was down in uh, Grace and Hope in the church plant, which was greatly encouraging and great to watch the service here later as well with David um, and to reflect on, on that verse that he read, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And there's a couple of responses to that that you can immediately do. First of all, is come to our prayer meeting uh, each time we meet. So this week, uh, 8 o'clock on Wednesday, uh, as we continue to pray for the harvest here and in our community and much wider around the world as well. Uh, and the other thing is to be a part of the answer to the prayers. Uh, that might be through uh, mission in all kinds of ways. You'll be hearing some more about that uh, today, but it's also right here uh, in the congregation in lots of ways. When Michaela came, we said, uh, folks, this is not us getting someone to come and do this. This is someone coming to work with us, and there'll be many opportunities for us to work alongside. So whether that's being part of the team for uh, the drop-in, whether that's going knocking doors, whether that's praying, uh, there's lots of different ways in which we are involved together uh, in God's work. So Michaela is going to come up and mention one particular thing that's happening uh, that you might be able to help in a small way as well. It's one of my favorite things to do in the whole entire week. Um, and it's amazing. And there's lots of young people who come along just because we're open. But there are a few who come along who would happily sit on after drop-in finishes and just chat. So we're going to offer them a Christianity Explored course. It's going to be on Thursday evenings and starting on the 4th of May. So what you can do right off the bat is to pray that the right ones and the right number of people come along. So I've kind of, in my mind, if there's four to eight, that's the sort of number that I'm looking for. And so just pray about that. Pray that some of the young people come along. It's a new thing, so it might be a bit strange for them. Um, and pray as well that if we don't get the numbers that we want, that we'll not be just too disappointed and we'll just wait and run at a different time. So just pray about that for me. And pray if they're under, they might understand once they're there what they're talking about and what we're learning. Um, and that they're at this kind of critical age where they're either going to decide they're going to go and do their own thing or they're going to follow Jesus. So we want to um, encourage them to have time to follow Jesus. So the other thing besides praying is if you, you would like to volunteer to make some food for us. So there's seven Thursday nights and they each start at six o'clock with food. Now they're teenagers, so it doesn't have to be anything terribly fancy. A big pot of something is perfectly fine. Um, and to do the dishes afterwards, which leaves us free to then go and talk to the kids. Um, so that would be really helpful if you want to team up and get a couple of people to do that, or you want to do it, you feel you could do that. Um, speak to Gillian because she's going to sort of look after all that part of stuff and look after the hospitality side. So thank you in advance, everybody, and make sure you pray, please. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michaela. And just a few verses from Ephesians to remind us about why we're here and what this is all about as we come to worship. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We stand to sing, God of grace, amazing wonder. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Father, we come today and we stand in awe of your love for us. There is nothing about us as people who have turned and gone our own way and rebelled against you that would cause you to love us. But you love us because you are love. You offer your grace to us. You have proven that to us in so many ways, but most especially in sending Jesus, your son, into the world and all the way to the cross. Lord, you pursue us uh, with your love and your grace because you long for us to come and return to you. You long for us to receive your forgiveness and grace. You long for us to be transformed by it. Father, help us in new ways this morning to understand that, to take hold of it, to grasp it, to be changed by it, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I, I need a little... Uh, uh, volunteer for this. Uh. Okay, then, since you volunteered, you're lucky behind you because you were about to get picked. Mm. Right. Just stand here. You don't need to do very much, all right? So, 
just want you to hold that nice packet of mom sweets. They're pretty much everybody's favorite, aren't they, in Sunday school? Yeah? Mm, okay. Now, I want you to imagine that, that you had to, you know, that that cost you, okay? That you had to maybe work hard, you know, do some, some stuff at home, maybe spend your own pocket money. You know, th those sweets didn't come easy to you, okay? Do you imagine that? Right. I want you to pick another kid and give them away. Is that okay? Is that all right? Is that, I mean, are you, are you happy to do that? You sure? Okay, go down, go down, give them to him. Don't, don't make the poor man have to get up and all. Right. Yeah, just give them. Right. right, come back, come back. You're not done yet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you're really nice, aren't you? But, I mean, if you'd really kind of, if that was the only ones you had and you'd worked hard for those, it would be a wee bit hard to give them away, wouldn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah. Be honest, be honest. Another packet here. Right, I want you to imagine this time, you didn't have to do anything for them, I just, you know, because you're so, because your smile is so nice, I just decided to give them to you, okay? I want you to give them away to somebody else. Anna, okay. Right, was that a wee bit easier? A mm, wee bit easier, yeah, because it doesn't, you know, it wasn't like you'd had to work hard to get them or anything, you just, just give them, so... Give you another one. Who are you going to give them to? Okay. Well, <coughs> going to be some fights down the back row. So there's two more to take down to the back row and give those away. Okay. Great exercise, isn't it? So is it getting easier to get them away? Because they're just coming so easy, aren't they? Right, there's three this time. Now, who have we, who, who make sure we get, you see Logan, Logan, Ellie. Yeah, you, you know where they are. There you go. Right. And look, even more. Hey, look, there's, there's Joan over there. An idea. And anybody, even if you've given all, all the littler people, you can, give, you can give big people as well, right? But make sure there's Joan, there's Joan. There's Joan. <laughs> anybody want some? Anybody think anybody's been missed? Uh, There, Johnny, your dad wants some. <laughs> right? We got any left? Give them all away. Give them all away. No, it's easy to deserve that. Is that. Have you given them all away yet? We still won. For goodness sake, hurry up. Right? Daddy and Granny. Huh? <laughs> now, now, I'm going to give you the rest of them. And you can just keep these to later and give them away, okay? But before you go, does it get harder and harder or easier and easier to give away? It gets easier and easier, doesn't it? Whenever you keep getting more and more given to you, it gets easier and easier to give them away. So you can go and sit down, you can keep those, and you can give them away later and make sure in Sunday so that everybody's got some, okay? So very simple thing there. You see, when we, when we kind of have to work hard for things, we kind of find it hard to give away. But when it comes easy to it, it gets easier and easier to give away. Now, I want you to think about God's love. We don't do anything for that. God's love to us, God's kindness to us, God's grace to us. He just shows it to us every day in all of the things that he does for us. He's shown it to us in Jesus. And because he keeps on giving and giving and giving to us, then we have so much that we can give away. And the more and more we get of God's love and grace, the more and more we should give it away. And the more and more we understand of it, then the more and more easier it should be for us to give it away. So it should be easier and easier for us to be kind to other people, not hard. It should be easier and easier for us to be generous to people. It should 
be easier and easier for us to love other people because we know what God has loved us so much. It should be easier and easier to be good to other people, to be graceful, to forgive them when they do wrong things about us because the more and more we get that God has done that for us and keeps on doing it for us over and over, then we can learn to keep on doing and giving it away and doing it over and over again for other people. Okay, we're going to stand and sing uh, again, and then the children can leave just straight after this. Uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
Okay, we have uh, an opportunity again today to get a little bit of an uh, update on some of the, the mission work, the wider work that we're involved in. Um, and we're delighted to have uh, Sandy Cranston from uh, Lyft. Hopefully many of you know about that, but some of the newer folks might not know much about Lyft. Uh, we've been involved with Lyft and folks have been going on teams with Lyft since uh, 2006, so quite, quite a long uh, association. So Sandy, going to hand over to you to give us a little update on on Lyft and the things that are happening now. Thanks. Oh, just the one to that camera. Okay, well. Do you want that one? Do you want this one? <laughs> okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much um, this morning for giving us the opportunity um, and Lyft to come and speak to you. As Alan rightly said, um, you have been involved in Lyft for many years. Um, and it's really just an update um, for people that have been involved and something, something new to people that maybe haven't been involved. So Lyft is an organization um, that I've worked for um, for maybe 10 or 15 years now. Um, so we're just going to give you a bit of an introduction and tell you some of the work that we're continuing to do. So Lyft itself stands for labor in faith and trust. And our ethos is that we serve the Lord God whom we serve as able, obviously from Daniel. So all the work that we do and everything that we're involved in, um, is heavily, is heavily uh, weighted towards the Lord and the, we give all the glory in everything that we do to, we do to serve the Lord. Um, the number of lift projects, we normally run 10 to 12 lift projects every year. And as you can see there, a lot of it is we, all, we encourage um, the, the local missionaries, um, we encourage local Christians, local volunteers. And as you can see, obviously, a um, picture of your church there because you have been involved with us, as Alan said, for quite a number of time. Um, basically, our ethos is we, we provide practical help to missionaries, and essentially what we do, we have a labor force. So we would send a labor force out um, to various parts of the world, um, and it's been over about 24 years now. Um, we send them out to various parts of the world, provide a labor force, and obviously then um, we're bringing the gospel message through that labor force when we're, when we're in those different countries. Okay, so just some statistics for you. Um, we've been going for about 24 years. Um, originally, it started in 1999. Um, Gary Moore and John Purse um, went to a trip in Guinea-Bissau um, uh, with a couple of other Christians and they decided that it was something they wanted to continue to do. And when they came back, um, through much thought and prayer after that, they formed Lyft as an organization, um, say 24 years ago. And over those 24 years, we have, take, we have been part of 201 projects, say normally 10 or 12 every year. Um, we have had 1,731 1, volunteers and people who have gone away on trips. Um, 412 different churches um, have been sent out um, with uh, 43 different countries, um, 46 different mission organizations, seven long-term missionaries. So things that we've done over the last 24 years, but the most important thing is the one God that we serve. So everything that we're doing, we're bringing glory to God in everything that we have, and we're very conscious that we do that when we go away to different places. Again, as mentioned there on the last one, it says we have seven long-term missionaries, or we have had, but at the moment we only have one full-time missionary, and this is Louise Little, who is currently serving in Mount Basara in Madagascar. Um, she is a qualified nurse. She works um, in the hospital in the ICU unit, and we have had several teams that have gone out to Mount Basara, and we've built um, and installed various things and electricity and different things in this ICU unit. Um, Louise has been with us for a long time, and she's also at the moment um, expanding the mission that she does. She's going and getting involved in the, the local women's prison and she's bringing the gospel to them. So we're supporting her on a regular basis. So obviously for prayer points, this is something that we would encourage you to, encourage you to do with us. Um, also then we have our outreach here in Northern Ireland, um, the Lift Coffee House. Uh, Gary would shout at me because it's not a coffee shop, it's, it's a coffee house. So you have to be very particular when you're calling it. It's a coffee house that we're dealing with. Um, the seed and bean. Obviously, the seed is the gospel, and then the bean is the coffee bean that we're doing. It's on the Ballysillan Road, um, and it's basically it's our local outreach. So um, Gary has told me to tell you, if you're anywhere up on the Ballysillan Road, the first cup of coffee is on him, so feel free to come up and visit us. Okay. When we researched it at the time, Gary and I don't, didn't really, we, we looked at uh, having an outreach here. Um, and the one thing that we researched, one thing that we learned, if you have good, good scones and good coffee, people will come. Okay. So... You're more than welcome. Come up, have a, have a cup of coffee with us, as I say, and you'll be very welcome. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, say, so projects, projects 2023, just to give you an update on those. We have several projects left. Um, Norway, Colombia, Madagascar, Zambia, Poland, Israel, two projects to Israel and Niger. Normally, as I say, we like to do 10 or 12 projects a year. 
they're all involving the missionary teams and the churches, as you can see, and you can see the cost of those that we put up as well. Um, this year, the amount of projects has been slightly reduced. Obviously, we had problems and um, we had some difficulties when it was during COVID that we couldn't do as many projects that we like and we couldn't travel and we couldn't do them. But we thank God that the, the, the amount of projects are coming back around again and, and these are the ones that hopefully will be going on this year. So if any of you feel free or feel free you want to volunteer for any of these just to give you a bit of insight into them as well. So the cost of a project, as you can see down the, down the right-hand side, um, just to give you an insight into what each project um, costs, um, what you pay for the cost then is it, it's the flights, transport, food, accommodation, insurance, PPE, anything else that you need to. You get a lift t-shirt, you get one of these for church on Sunday, you also get a fleece and everything else is provided for you. What we don't cover then um, is all the things on the right-hand side, so sightseeing, cleaning, snacks, anything like that. But normally the missionaries that we go to visit are always very keen to help us out with all those things as well. I think I have done over, I think it's about 15 or 16 projects at the moment. And one thing that I'm very encouraged by is that the missionaries, when you go to see them, you're not a tourist. You do get to see some of the tourist um, activities that are going on. But it's great to be there because they will take you out and they will show you the real um, country that you're visiting. So it's from that point of view, it's excellent that you get to actually meet the local people and get involved in the culture with it as well, which I'm going I'm to give you an example of one now. Just very quickly, what I want to do is I want to talk just one project just to, just to give you a flavor of it, okay, as to things that we would do. So one of the projects that we did about four or five years ago was in Zambia. Um, just geographically, you can see Zambia is, is located down there in Central Africa. We work with a, an organization called Oasis Village. Um, it's a primary school. Um, they have um, missionaries that came from here. It was a, a lady from here. She was a school teacher. She married a guy from Zambia, and they started this school. They now, they started off with 50 or 60 orphans at the school and educated them, and the school now functions with about 500 pupils in it. Okay, so it's just to let you see this sort of type of thing we do. Obviously, the school children are all there. You can see the posters up on the wall. They all, they're all very well catered for. They have uniform. They're all very well looked after within the school. Um, sometimes when we go as well, as you can see this guy here, he's got a paintbrush. This was one of the projects that we were on. They're all very, very keen to help. Okay, and as you can see the lady in the background, all the orphans live in different houses, and each house has a house mum, and she would look after those children within that, and then obviously they go to the school itself. Okay, So obviously in all the projects, we will do joinery work. Um, we will also do plumbing, different aspects of that, and electrical work, okay? Um, so, but if you're not qualified in a pl as a plumber, an electrician, or a joiner, um, you can be what we call, and you'll see it on our list of projects, which I'll, I have some with me, um, you're called a handy enthusiast, okay? If you're a handy enthusiast, if you can work with someone, we're more than help you're more than glad that you can work with an electrical plumber or joiners when you're there, okay? So, as part of that, we also get an opportunity to go out into the village and go out and see the local children. Um, on this project, we sometimes what happens is we are able to get um, certain things that they ask you to do before you get there, but generally that will change on occasion whenever you get there, okay? So this was one of the guys, he was out, it was a local children, and what they had, this was their schoolhouse come church or whatever they wanted to use it for. Um, it was fairly run down, fairly dilapidated, and one of the guys said to us, look, would there be any chance that, I know we asked you to do certain things in the orphanage, but could you maybe come out and give us a hand to rebuild some of this stuff outside, okay? Oops, sorry. So these are the kids that are at the school. Um, so this is, this is lunchtime, so they have their school meals out, with the, out in the open. And this is typically what they would have. Now, obviously, the children have left, so it's always good fun when you see the children here. The pot on, on this side of it is, it's enzima. It's like a paste or a, it's a maze that they ground down. They make a paste out of it. It's awful stuff, but they flavor it with gravy or chicken or something else. The one on the right-hand side, um, I'm not going to ask anyone to guess what it is. It's actually caterpillars. They farm caterpillars in certain parts of Africa because they're having, they're having difficulties with the size of the population. So they're running out. They don't have enough meat. They don't have enough animals. So they act, but they're not the same caterpillars that you would pick off the hedges here. So normally when the children are here, we say, don't pick anything off the hedges and try it. So, but they, they do these. And act, to be honest with you, they, they don't taste like chicken. Everybody thinks everything tastes like chicken. They taste like a sort of smoky bacon sort of taste off them. And they're not as bad as you would think. They're actually OK. So as part of our mission trip, when we go, you will not be expected to. But if you want to try stuff like this, it's always very good, OK? So this is what they said to us. Can you start and can you build us a, a, a version of that schoolhouse that they had? So all the wood, all the posts, we did a very rough sketch and rough design when we were there. Um, what they said to us then, all the wood came from the local forest. Um, so as you can see there, it started to take progress. It started to, to go fairly well. Um, and we used all the different wood and different planks that came from that. We were cutting them to size. I'll just very quickly go through it. 
all these guys then were locals, um, local guys from the local villages and community. We, we wanted them to be involved to ensure that they were part of the process and they had ownership of it. As you can see here, more progress going on. Um, oh, sorry to click the two more. Again, once we started to get the roof on, um, this was all the wood and everything that they provided for us. And say so once they really started to get ahead of it, then we were able to, we funded some of the tin sheets for the roof. Eventually we got the roof on. As you can see, it really did take shape. Where am I? Um, more or less the finished thing, the roof from the inside, just to let you see it. And these were all the guys here. What they're actually doing there at the moment, they're putting pillars in and they're going to use them as seats. And you can see we had enough. We always have plenty of lift T-shirts because if we're working with them, we give everybody a lift T-shirt and everyone can work with them during the day. Um, what they then did, oh, I keep going too far. So this was actually it finished and this was the place they were going to have worship on the Sunday. This guy here that you can see, the guy sitting on the, the extreme left, he was the pastor and he was absolutely delighted that he now had this facility that he could preach to everyone and they could also use it as a schoolhouse. And you can see we had a bit of a service for the guys in the middle, okay? Everyone got their t-shirts and basically what they did then, um, the next day, they're all washed out in the line, prayed a place um, and they were able to sort of work with us and we continue on with it. So I have some, some literature with me out on the table. If you want to take one, as I say, have a read through it. If you can't go, we would ask you, please pray for us when anyone else goes. But you're more than welcome. If you want to come, come up for a coffee in the seed and bean. Um, but the literature is all out there. So as I say, there's been a big connection with, with your congregation for a very long time. And we know that continues. And we are hope and, hope and trust that it does continue. Um, but thank you very much for the time. And hopefully that updates people as to what we have been doing. And if you're not aware of Lyft, um, I'll be here. Jeff is very kind to offer they need to buy me a cup of coffee or supply me with a cup of coffee after service. So I'll be here for a while if you just want to come and have a chat. Okay? So thank you very much. I'll hand back over to Alan. Well, Sandy, I, I think I'm pretty sure how I would be categorized as a, a not so handy enthusiast. I think that's where I fit in. It's great to know where we all fit into these different things anyway, isn't it? Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna pray and we'll be pick up on some of those things and others as well. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing way in which you uh, call us to yourself and then to be your servants in the world. We thank you that you bring your church together and that you give so many different gifts uh, and such variety of gifts that we might be able to serve you together. Lord, we, we thank you for those in leadership and those who have hospitality gifts. We thank you for those who teach and we thank you for those who organize. And we thank you as we've thought today about all those who have uh, practical uh, gifts and talents as well. Lord, we pray within the life of our own congregation that you would help us uh, to, to recognize the gifts that you've given and to be willing uh, to, and ready to use those gifts to serve you, uh, to build up your church and to reach out into our community here. Lord, we thank you for uh, the work of Lyft over these 20-odd uh, years. Uh, we thank you for that vision, uh, Lord, when so often teams are about people doing particular things, that in fact there was a real need and opportunity for people with uh, practical skills to go and to serve you. And we thank you for all of those people. Uh, we thank you for all of those teams uh, over the years. Lord, we uh, thank you for how they've been able to uh, navigate their way uh, through uh, COVID, uh, Lord, and we just continue to pray for the organization, uh, for uh, Gary and for uh, others, Lord, be, be with them, bless them, give them your wisdom and leading uh, as they seek to continue to uh, develop the work, as they develop partnerships and uh, arrange, uh, make arrangements for teams in all kinds of uh, different places. Lord, we recognize again the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we pray that you would continue to raise up workers for this work. Lord, we thank you for all of the teams that are planned uh, this year, uh, Lord, and uh, it's, it's, it's to get the time, to get the money, uh, to get the teams together. Lord, we hand it all over uh, to you. We pray that you would provide the folks 
and the resources for these teams, uh, that you would go ahead of them and prepare the way, uh, that you would help them in all that they seek to do, that they would be a blessing to the missionaries and organizations that they work alongside, uh, that they would learn and grow in their faith as they stretch themselves and as they serve you, and Lord, that you would make a difference for your kingdom as they go out and as they show and share your love and your good news. So, Father, just continue to bless this work, we pray, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're uh, going to turn again to uh, God's Word, uh, to Second Samuel, and we're moving on to uh, chapter 9 this morning. I'm going to read from, uh, well, right through the chapter, which is just uh, 13 verses. So let's hear God's word uh, together. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still the son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machar, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Machar, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth uh, bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Amen. We thank God for his word to us. And before we come to think about that, we're going to uh, just stand to sing uh, two pieces. Uh, the first one is, Thy loving kindness is better than life. And I'm kind of scanning to see recognition for that one. Uh, I think we'll maybe, we'll maybe just have the tune through once, and I think it's going to come back to you. And then we'll stand and join in that. And then we'll continue with a quieter piece, Such Love, Pure as the White as Snow. Let's stand together. I would help. Shall praise thee, thus 
I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, random acts of kindness. You know, where you just randomly go and do something kind. You give a gift to a stranger. You help someone out. You go beyond what's normally expected, say, and giving a, a big <coughs> tip to someone who has served you well. I, know, I knew it was a relatively modern thing, but I, I did wonder where it came from. And so a few clicks on the internet, and I found that apparently uh, there was a woman called Anne Herbert uh, in California in 1982, and she had read the very cynical and depressing phrase, random acts of violence and senseless acts of cruelty. And she took out a placemat and changed it around, random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty, and wrote a book about it in the 90s as well. And it's kind of slipped into our culture and become a thing, hasn't it? And that includes amongst Christians. For example, you'll, you'll see teams come in the summer and do work, and they'll, they'll say they're going out into the community for an afternoon to do random acts of kindness. And that's maybe no bad thing in a world where we have to be reminded just to be kind, where people are usually driven by getting rather than giving. And even those who usually give, kind of give only when they will get back. You know, I invite you, and then you'll invite me, I pay for you, and then you'll pay for me, you know. Or even more subtly, where sometimes we give, but we're really filling ourselves because we're just really giving so that we can feel better about ourselves. In this story, we have read about David and significant acts of kindness, but they are not random acts of kindness. They didn't just pop in his head, didn't just think, I must do something kind for somebody. They are thought through, they're with purpose and their reason, and, and they are kindnesses which are not about uh, getting in order to give back there, and they are kindnesses with a deep significance that you see as you begin to delve into the story. So let's just remind ourselves of what happens, of what we read. David, uh, now, of course, uh, after uh, all of the, the years of being chosen and then in the king's palace and then as a, as a fugitive, he's, he's now well settled. He's now king not only over Judah but over all of Israel. He's in his palace in Jerusalem. Things are good. His enemies are defeated. And then one day he asks if there are any descendants of Saul still around. And obviously there's been quite a few years have passed since Saul and his sons were, were killed and David became, became king. And uh, through a servant, they find out that there's one descendant that he's sent for. 
And his name's class, isn't it? It's one of those things that you'd just hate would to be asked to do the reading this morning, wouldn't you? You know, trying to get your, your tongue around that one. Um, Mephibosheth, but if you think he was hard done by with his name, then that was nothing. Let me just go back to uh, chapter 4 of uh, 2 Samuel, and there's just uh, one verse, chapter 4, verse 4, in brackets, just a little note. Uh, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. That's the news they'd been killed. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as he hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. And so there was this terrible tragedy that had befallen him in the midst of this terrible thing that his father and grandfather uh, were dead. He's picked up by his nurse and she drops him and he's uh, crippled. And so now this presumably young man is living with disability, dependent on others, and in obscurity. And David brings him in and showers kindness upon him. I notice some of the things about the kindness of David towards Mephibosheth. First of all, it's unexpected. Very clear that that's the case. Did you notice when Mephibosheth is brought into David's presence, David's first words to him are, do not be afraid. You see, the normal protocol would be to dispose of any threat to you, including any of the descendants of any rival uh, or previous ruler. So Mephibosheth must have wondered, really, what's coming? And when David speaks of what he wants to do for him, Mephibosheth says, why would you notice a dead dog like me? And that's not just like, you know, feeling a bit wick about yourself. That's, that's a huge, you know, dogs are unclean. You know, it's, it's like the biggest insult you could, you could say about yourself. I'm nothing. He expected nothing. He was, did not think he was in any position or of any character or of any worth uh, to just have any goodness or any kindness towards him. It was completely, in every way, unexpected. It was also undeserved, uh, not only unexpected, but undeserved. Mephibosheth had done nothing to make himself deserving of anything from the king. He was owed nothing. He could contribute nothing. He had lost everything. He'd lost his status, his position. He'd lost his wealth. He'd lost his independence. He'd lost his health and his mobility. He had nothing to offer a king who had everything. Even where he now lived, it's almost a little bit of a kind of corny joke. And the passage low to bar meant not worth mentioning. He was a nobody from nowhere. He was completely undeserving of this kindness toward him. And it was unlimited, well, virtually unlimited. By that, I want you to see just the, the immensity of the kindness that was shown to him. The, the land uh, was restored to him. Along with that, uh, the king's uh, chief servant, Ziba, and his family uh, and servants, and we hear all about the numbers of those people. They were all to work for him and to provide for him. He was given a place at the king's table, and that, of course, is not just about getting food in your stomach every day. That is uh, like being treated like a son. That is being brought into the family. That is about belonging. That is about status and position. And the kindness extended not only to Mephibosheth, but to his son Micah, and to the servant, and to his extended family. All of this, all of these people and all of these ways were brought into this amazing act of generosity and kindness and goodness. It was amazing. It could simply not have been imagined. So I want to ask this question. What was motivating David? Why did he act the way that he did? Why did he show such amazing kindness to Mephibosheth? He didn't need to. There was no pressure or expectation upon him, and he was the king. He could do whatever he liked anyway. There was no need to do this, so why? I think there's a few things going on. First of all, there's the purposes of God. Remember back when David uh, had opportunity uh, to kill Saul himself, not just on one, but on a, at least a couple of occasions, and he had refused to take matters into his own hands, even when it would have been so understandable. He'd been a fugitive for, for years. He was, you know, in a, in a terrible place. And why would he not do that? Why would he not take things into his own hands? Because he knew that God had appointed Saul as king, and despite the fact that Saul had failed and turned from God in many ways, and despite the fact that David had been chosen by God, it was God's prerogative 
to act when and how he chose. It wasn't David's to try to sort out what God was going to do, God's way and God's time. And there's a reminder there, a very real reminder about our real need to trust in not only the purposes, uh, but the providence of God and his ways and his timing. That's why David was doing this, because he knew that there was still a way to honor God and honoring the house of Saul that God had brought about. And then there are also the promises, the promises that David and Jonathan had made to each other, um, Mephibosheth's father, his very good friend, Saul's son. Remember how uh, Jonathan had warned him of the danger that he was in uh, from Saul and this uh, story where they, they acted out this thing so that he would know whether he needed to, to flee or not. Uh, uh, but maybe you don't remember uh, the promises that they made to one another at that point uh, when they had to part. Let me read from uh, 1 Samuel 20 when J Jonathan promises to warn David and David uh, has to leave for safety. Jonathan said, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may never be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. And then later as they part, Jonathan says to him, go in peace for we have shorn, sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between you, your descendants and my descendants forever. Wow, what amazing promises, what amazing commitments, not only for life, but even for family and for the generations to come. See, they understood the, the, the significance of, of covenant, of, of making and of keeping promises. And so David had never forgotten the promises that had been made between him and Jonathan all those years ago. And now, years later, he is making good on them. He is keeping his word. He is fulfilling his promise. That in itself, again, is just a, an amazing lesson how, how quickly and easily and thoughtlessly we can make promises that we cannot or will not or have very real intention of keeping, never mind keeping for the rest of our lives. But there's an even more significant thing, I think, which is the motivation and the reason and the whole thing we're meant to see in this story. And it is God's loving kindness. David was not just showing his own kindness. He was showing God's loving kindness. That was the heart of the commitment, not just to show God, to show kindness. Do you remember what Jonathan said? But to show kindness like the Lord's kindness. To be kind in the way that God has been and is kind. And so from the promises uh, made years uh, before, we come to this point, and David says, who of Saul's descendants can I show kindness to? That's the whole thrust and, and reason for this passage. Who is there that I can show this kindness of God to? And the word used in, in the Old Testament and here is, is a really special one. It, it's a word hesed. It's sometimes translated as loving kindness, hence, hence the chorus. Uh, it's the faithful, generous love and kindness that is demonstrated by God himself. An amazing thing. Undeserving, but God shows his hesed, his loving kindness, his generosity, his goodness, his faithfulness, his love toward people. But here's the thing. It is a pointer to something even more amazing, to the amazing love and grace of God. You see it in the Old Testament, but it finds its fullest expression in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, and the giving of Jesus coming into the world and dying for us. It points to the grace of God toward us, which is all of the things that da was demonstrated by David's kindness. So see this parallel. What was David's kindness like? And he was to be kind like the Lord's kindness. Well, isn't God's kindness and grace just the same? It's unexpected. Totally unexpected. We expect a, a holy God, if he is like that, to judge us harshly. Not to love us, not to offer us forgiveness, not to want to restore us, not to be kind and generous to us. It's unexpected. We're like, what? Really? It's undeserved because we have turned away from God. We have rebelled against him and we have no ability to sort that out ourselves, no ability to make ourselves good enough, no 
nothing we can do. We have nothing to offer. We have nothing to contribute. It's totally undeserved. Nothing that we have makes us deserving. Nothing that we are. And it's completely unlimited. There is no one beyond the grace of God except those who refuse it. There is no one who can't receive it except those who reject it. And it is immense in its breadth and depth. We can be forgiven. We can be brought into the family of the King of Kings. We can sit at his table. We are provided for. We have a new status, a new position, a new value, a new purpose. And all of this comes from the unexpected, undeserved, unlimited grace and love of God. And if you can't get it from an Old Testament story, look at Jesus and how he was with people who were undeserving and how unexpectedly he loved them and showed grace to them. And if you can't get it from that, look at the cross and see the fullness of what God has given to us in his love and mercy and kindness and generosity. Look at the empty tomb and see the victory of Jesus over everything, over sin and death and hell. And if you can't get it from all of those things, then just look at the lives of people who have been forgiven and transformed by his love and grace. Unexpected, undeserved, unlimited. So I want to finish with two questions. Question number one, have you responded to that grace? Have you accepted that grace? Have you been able to accept your need of that grace? Because that's the first and the hardest part to recognize that you need it, that there's no other way. There's nothing you can do yourself. But get past that, get over that, and there is grace for you. And God never turns away anyone who comes seeking his grace. Be in no doubt about that. If you come looking for his grace and his forgiveness and his love, it is there. You will not be the first person to be turned away. It is there and it is there for you. Think about that if you never really have before. Think about that today. Have you responded to that grace yourself? And then the other question is, are you living in response to that grace? You see, it's only when you have received, like the sweets, the loving kindness of God that you can learn to be truly kind and give it away to others. It's only when you have responded to the grace of God that you can be full of grace, gracious, graceful towards others. Let me share a personal story. The kindest person I think I ever met was Jillian's uncle. He passed away when Leah was just a bump, nearly expected, about 20 years ago. Actually, he wasn't a real uncle. Uh, he was one of those uncles. He was a friend of the family, but in fact, a real uncle. Some of you know and have that in your families. Others don't. That's okay. Bobby would have done anything for anyone, but none less than Jillian and her brother, and increasingly so when they had lost their mom, uh, continuing when they grew up, when they got married, uh, to their spouses and to their children as well. He would have given anything. He would have given of his time. He would have given of his money, whatever you needed. He was there. He would drop anything. He would sort anything. He would help with anything. You could not have wanted for anyone else as part of your family and in your life. And he never wanted anything in return. And I always wondered how and why he was motivated to be that way. Excuse me. And he was so kind. It turned out that as a young man, he had lost his parents and Jillian's father had taken him under his wing and looked after him, and it was something that he had never forgotten and something that he felt he could never repay. And his gratitude was such that he was now repaying it over three generations, for goodness sake. By any calculation, if there was any debt, he had fully paid it. But you see, he had experienced unexpected, undeserved, and to his mind, unlimited kindness, and he willingly and happily gave it back all of his life and from one generation to the next. Do you get it? See, I think part of the problem with us Christians is that I wonder if we've fully taken in the immensity of the love and kindness and grace of God for us. I wonder have we got a little bit too used to it. I wonder have we really been impacted by it and filled with it. I wonder do we truly say and understand there but for the grace of God go I. 
lives. We need that more and more. Why? So that we might show more and more of that kindness of God, of that love and that grace to others. Because that's what people need. Because that's how they get their first glimpse of the amazing, unexpected, undeserved, unlimited love and kindness and grace of God for them. Amen. Let's take a moment to, to pray. Let's just take a moment of, of quiet, a moment of response. We're not big into altar calls and actions. Just take a moment in your heart to ask, have I really responded myself to that grace? Or am I just here because that's what I do on a Sunday? Have we ever really done that? And whatever you need to do in, in response to that, to, to pray and to receive it, to come and trust in Jesus for the first time, to talk to someone about it, then resolve to do that. And maybe you know you have, but maybe you know that you've got to use to the grace of God, that it's not filling you, transforming you, pouring out of you into your attitudes and actions towards others. And just simply repent of that and pray that you might be impacted more and more by that grace and that others then might see it in you. So Lord, we thank you we thank you today for your unexpected, undeserved, and unlimited kindness, love, and grace toward each one of us, no matter who we are, what we think of ourselves, what others think of us, what we're like, or what we've done. Lord, we are in awe and amazement of it. And we pray that you would help us to respond to it, and to take it in. We pray that you would help us to be transformed by it and to live it out that others might see it in us. Lord, come and hear our prayer, for we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Keep our, our seats as we watch. Listen, join in as you're comfortable to the final song, Reckless.
was your fault Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no Thank you as always to those who help and welcome and worship and in all kinds of ways on a Sunday morning and encouragement to stay for uh, refreshments afterwards and now the grace. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. <laughs>